Today we continue with our lectures on the methods in neuroendocrinology. And uh, first I'll take you to the uh, WebCT page to show you some of the links that will be used in future methods lectures. This lecture is uh, covering the methods 1B uh, in C2 hybridization and immunocytochemistry. Uh, some of the upcoming lectures are on more, let's say, sophisticated, maybe complex uh, methods. And uh, these links that we'll uh, go to briefly here and that you can review uh, more closely uh, will help you to understand the presentations on those methodological approaches. So let's switch over to the computer here and take you to the, the WebCT page. Of course, under course materials, course content, uh, you see on the list there's methods in neuroendocrinology 1, methods in neuroendocrinology 2, and the DNA microarray and differential uh, display technologies. The links under these may not uh, still be functional uh, and may disappear year after year, but I think most of them are all right. So there's one on uh, hormones and behavior module that would uh, cover the, oh, that one's not working anymore. <laughs> Assays of hormones and receptors. I know this one uh, is uh, uh, not letting us uh, connect anymore either. It used to go directly to the course. Now uh, apparently they have uh, set it up so you have to log in. Uh, Radio amino assays, link here. Now it appears that you have to be <laughs> a subscriber for the, this to use this. So what used to be free is uh, apparently not anymore. Uh, but I have used uh, some of these materials uh, in the pre development of the PowerPoint presentations. Uh, so uh, you'll be able to uh, get the important information that you will need, in particular for those directly from the slides. Here's another research article that is still uh, posted uh, relative to some of the methods uh, that we'll be talking about, including bioassays, uh, as well as uh, using uh, protein detection methods. Same here for an article on growth hormone, hormone and amino acids. Uh, let's see if the antigen antibody interaction still works. Uh, that one's not working. And making and using antibodies, let's check on that one. This is a really nice site. Uh, it's still active, at least here in October of 2005, and hopefully it will continue to be so uh, throughout the years, because it also uh, has information not only on proteins, as, uh, not only on the making and using of antibodies as shown here, but as uh, uh, for proteins and cDNAs and DNA and genes. So it's really a very nice uh, methods site, and uh, you should refer to this and read over especially this information on the antibodies uh, and uh, some of the related information. I believe there's uh, information on the affinity of antibodies in here as well, so it's a good idea to take a look at that link. And what else have we got on here? So then to the methods two, uh, I think uh, this one for the detection of uh, catecholamines, electrochemical detector is no longer uh, taking us directly to the site that was so useful. Yeah, it's a, a bit disappointing. <laughs> so now it just goes to the main company site. Same for this one. Same for this one. That's a shame. HPL of steroids, same for that one. <laughs> Looks like we lost a lot of our links here. So you can see this is the difficulty of trying to use these sites. Uh, this is still working. This is a very good one. Uh, I recommend that you visit this site as soon as you can. Uh, we obviously aren't going to get into uh, many of the calculations that you would find on these sites, uh, but we will talk about some of the related concepts uh, that are very important in understanding the utility of these uh, methods.
Remember, another objective of our evaluation of methods is the limitations of the methods and how they are uh, utilized to examine the biological samples. If it's a homogenate and you're quantitating something, uh, then that's not a, a functional assay. It gives you some information and it limits uh, the interpretation that can be made. And as you're seeing from the tests by this uh, point of the, uh, the course, uh, we're beginning to move more and more so toward interpretation, uh, taking excerpts from either abstracts or research articles uh, and having you try to interpret uh, the information or seeing a figure and trying to draw conclusions from it. Uh, and select, trying to select ones that I have written, and uh, I know that that's challenging, but we're able to work around that. And this is that other link where um, uh, looking at the studies of the proteins. So these uh, links that will be very useful as a resource for you to turn to. Again, we're trying to study methods, uh, but not to become technical experts. We're just trying to expand our understanding and appreciation of the methods used uh, so that when we begin to talk about more of the research articles themselves, that we can really appreciate what uh, is uh, being performed on the samples to collect the data that we're evaluating. And then there's uh, these links on the uh, <clears throat> DNA microarray. This is a review from Nature Genetics. So that one is uh, still available. Uh, the anatomy of comparative gene expression is, is still uh, available. Let's see about the mic DNA microarray site here. Looks like that's still available. And how about the differential display? Yes, yeah, so all of these are available. These help us to understand approaches the more contemporary state-of-the-art approach is of asking questions about gene expression. So obviously we've talked about steroid uh, hormones and their ligand-dependent uh, transcription factor uh, receptors targeting uh, at the genomic level. And we've uh, always talked about the metabotropic water-soluble hormones acting through receptors with divergent pathways somewhere along their intracellular signaling mechanism targeting the nucleus to impact synthesis and other intracellular mechanisms either for the cellular response, the primary one of which we think about with target glandular organs is uh, the synthesis, excuse me, the secretion of the hormones. So we've always linked a genomic effect of the water-soluble hormones, whether it's on the target cell, uh, tissue, organ, uh, for the functional response or a target glandular cell within a target organ uh, for uh, uh, this cascading hormonal uh, system that we've been investigating in most of the neuroendocrine axes. <clears throat> and then you see the, uh, let me just go back to the, the course content list here. Basically the remainder of this uh, course content page list uh, is on the uh, different axes. These, uh, most of these are uh, copies of abstracts uh, directly from the literature. So we're going to use the content of the abstracts to generate our PowerPoint presentations. I've already done this. And then we might find uh, some more recent research articles and have a separate lecture recorded focusing on the figures basically from the research articles, uh, strengthening our ability to interpret uh, data from the primary literature. So again, now we're beginning to transition out of the introductory textbook. We've finished all the chapters in the introductory check textbook that we're going to use, uh, and we're proceeding to uh, extract information from the primary literature. We've used a few review articles along the way, uh, and I'd like to expand that in the future, but I think that uh, we've seen enough review research articles, so we appreciate contribution of textbooks, limitations of textbooks, overgeneralization of textbooks sometimes, uh, and the uh, utility of uh, uh, re the <laughs> review articles that are newer than our textbook. Uh, um, in many cases, uh, and very recent review articles to add to our knowledge base in more of a textbook format, and then obviously the primary literature uh, adds to uh, the update of our ongoing knowledge base. <clears throat>
database, if you will, uh, on a smaller incremental uh, proportion. Uh, now let's switch over to this uh, brief lecture in methods in neuroendocrinology 1B. Uh, if I have a few minutes remaining after this, I want to go to the, uh, the document camera. I still want to call it an overhead projector, but here in this day of technology, it's the document camera. And uh, discuss just very briefly uh, about uh, cell culture transfection methods and, of course, whole animal transfection methods so that we can manipulate genes within our bioassay systems uh, and ask particular types of questions, either about the uh, promoter region or the function of the gene itself. Uh, and then later we'll see some research articles based upon these methods. So we'll introduce it now and uh, review it in the context of uh, either the uh, primary literature from those readings of the um, the, the abstracts, or looking at individual papers uh, in great detail, basically the figures, not just the abstract. <clears throat> so in this lecture, we're going to talk about two particular assays, uh, primarily for localization and visualization, uh, and sometimes semi-quantitative uh, uh, evaluations of particular molecules of interest within the tissue or within cells. <clears throat> the first of these is uh, in situ hybridization. Whenever we see that the word in situ, it means in its situation, in its natural location uh, or unnatural location. If, for example, you put the gene into the uh, organism, uh, either the single cell uh, or tissue or the whole animal. And of course, the hybridization, whenever we hear hybridization, we think of either DNA to DNA or RNA to, D, R, to DNA or RNA to R, RNA hybridizing. So we know that we can form uh, the anti-parallel strands. They, uh, uh, if there's uh, a sufficient amount of pair matching, then you get them sticking together, hydrogen bonds, and at the right temperature, they melt basically and come apart. Uh, and uh, as uh, things uh, cool, if they have found each other and stuck together, then they stick together with a pretty high affinity so that uh, you can later wash off the unbound or wash away the unbound and just look at the double-stranded uh, molecules. Well, the in situ hybridization, and here we see it for neuro, obviously because of the neuroendocrinology, uh, proceeds uh, in these steps. The, uh, the whole animal is uh, involved in the experiment in this case. Could be cells and culture. It could be a slice of the brain and a tissue culture. Regardless of what it is, uh, it obviously uh, has to be uh, <clears throat> um, euthanized. I don't know if euthanized is the term you would use for the cells and culture and a slice of the brain that you're growing in, in a, a culture medium. Uh, you might kill those, but we don't use the word uh, kill when we talk about sacrificing the, the animal for research purposes. That's just one of those things that we do in science. We don't kill animals, we euthanize them. <clears throat> um, even though everything becomes dead and ultimately uh, prepared such that it is on a slide or if it's cell culture, it may be in a dish that you can later set on a microscope to visualize it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, the tissue has to be obviously thin enough for the penetration of the, uh, of the reagents, so the whole brain would have to be sectioned and mounted onto microscope slides. Once mounted and fixed to that, uh, cells and culture would be adherent to the bottom of the, uh, the whatever you're using to grow them in, <clears throat> a flask or a on a microscope slide itself, or on a, uh, uh, a cover slip, or in a little petri dish. Uh, they'd be fixed to the bottom. Um, early approaches uh, require, uh, did not allow uh, formaldehyde or any cross-linking agent to be added before you uh, had to get your uh, hybridization occurring. Uh, 
Now some of the methods uh, are developed so that you can cross-link your tissues and uh, make sure that in situ means in situ. Uh, you don't want things diffusing away from their original location. So the earlier you can get a cross-linking agent in there, like a fixative formaldehyde is the typical one, uh, <clears throat> to cross-link the proteins and hold everything in place. Sometimes in cell culture they use acetone uh, that will coagulate proteins. Anything just to trap structures and molecules where they are so they don't move after, uh, the, uh, after they're dead. So uh, <clears throat> we want to keep things in situ in their actual location. Then uh, obviously there's prepping the samples, washing, and uh, uh, getting the right uh, ionic conditions inside the tissue or around the cells and inside the cytoplasm whatever reagents need to get in there to do whatever they need to do. In some cases, uh, early methods at least, uh, after uh, getting things fixed in C2 and trapped within proteins, they would degrade the proteins to expose all the messenger RNA uh, in, the, in the tissue. <clears throat> so there was a, a proteinase uh, K that was very commonly used that you would uh, pretreat. So there's a variety of pretreatments, and the idea is to allow your messenger, your probe for the messenger RNA to get into the tissue. So I probably failed to mention from the very beginning uh, when we talked about hybridization uh, being DNA to DNA, uh, DNA to RNA, or RNA to RNA, uh, <clears throat> that this method is targeting the visualization and localization of messenger RNA. Uh, in cells, within tissue, uh, and so on and so forth, within the organs. So we now appreciate how we have to prepare the sample, uh, and this is, you know, keeping everything intact. You obviously can do a homogenate approach of this. It's called a, a northern blot, <clears throat> where you isolate the RNA, uh, and then you separate it, and you probe uh, just the same, but you can't say, well, it's in this cell in this part of the brain. So the in situ hybridization lets us localize as well as visualize and have a semi-quantitative. If you homogenize uh, your sample and use the west, excuse me, the northern blot approach, then uh, you can have uh, a, a quantitative, a more reliable quantitative measure of how much messenger RNA uh, is present within the sample that you took. And there are actually some. Uh, quite amazing micro techniques that are available. Uh, actually, UTSA this year will be uh, purchasing one. It's where you can use a microscope to view uh, a section of an organ like this, and then when you find the area you want, you trigger something in this program, a little laser comes in and zzz, cuts out the little piece you want, and that little piece can be extracted, and then you can take that little piece uh, that you micro dissected out of there with this fine laser microscope guided <laughs> type of a thing uh, and uh, analyze just it. So if you wanted to look at just the paraventricular nucleus or just the median eminence, uh, you can dissect that out from a, a piece of the tissue and somehow uh, get it off the slide and uh, process that to uh, sample. So these techniques are becoming much more powerful uh, for quantitative, uh, and this method is still quite sensitive for localization and visualization. I should reverse that, I guess. You visualize, and then that allows you to localize, but either way, you're doing both. The uh, probe uh, is obviously uh, <clears throat> developed to be specific for your messenger RNA, so it does have to be specific for some part of the messenger RNA that is unique to your molecule. Uh, during this year, I worked with a, a student that studied uh, oxytocin uh, expression in the brain, actually using DNA microarray and RT-PCR analysis that we'll uh, cover in another lecture, but it's the same thing. You have to develop, and uh, <clears throat> um, those methods, it's called a primer, but it's the same thing. It has to recognize it's to bind to and recognize a unique part of the messenger RNA. So I uh, sent that student to our endotech site and challenged the student to convince me that his probe design or his primer design um, excluded uh, vasopressin from the analysis. Uh, 
Okay, so vasopressin and oxytocin are, are very similar. They only differ by two amino acid uh, sequences. So I challenged him to convince me uh, that uh, he, was, he had a specificity uh, in his method. So the probe design has to be uh, approached very carefully so that you uh, uh, are assured of all those features that we've talked about. Uh, high specificity, a selectivity, it has a, a high affinity, and all those types of things, <clears throat> uh, so that you can say that I am looking at the molecule that I really want to look at. So probe design is very important. There's different approaches that can be taken, uh, and I'm going to go to the document camera for this part so I can make a few points there. <clears throat> so we recall that we have our gene that has exons and introns. So I'm just having uh, three exons here. And we recall that the messenger RNA represents just the, the exon parts after splicing and re-annealing. So the messenger RNA has the poly A tail and the five prime uh, cap on it. <clears throat> it is single stranded, as we recall. And so uh, if we de develop a cDNA to this, uh, it is, so if this is the three prime, so the, the cDNA would be uh, five prime to three prime, of course, in this direction. And the reason it's called a cDNA probe is because it's complementary to the message. It's not the, uh, it doesn't correspond, recall uh, that we have two strands of DNA, and it's the antisense strand of the DNA that is transcribed. Only the antisense strand is transcribed. So the messenger RNA really has the sequence that's equivalent, in RNA sense, I guess, uh, equivalent to the sense strand of the DNA, right? So you need an antisense cDNA probe to probe for the messenger RNA. <clears throat> now this can also be uh, an RNA, so a cRNA probe as well. Now whenever you work with RNA, you have to worry about RNases, so uh, <clears throat> in the tissue, that's not too bad. If you've got the RNA staying in the tissue, especially brain tissue, the RNase level, RNase obviously is the enzyme that degrades the RNA, is not extremely high. It's actually quite low compared to other tissues, so you do have that stability. Some uh, of the reagents still include RNase inhibitors just to maximize your um, uh, capabilities of detecting all of the messenger RNA. So if you're using an RNA probe, a cRNA probe, then all your reagents, uh, everything you do has to be uh, RNA ACE, uh, anti-RNA ACE uh, wise, right? <laughs> you have to be thinking constantly, do I have an RNase inhibitor in this? Have I destroyed all the RNase in my water that I'm using? And all those types of things. So methodologically, this is a bit more challenging, but everybody thinks that it's uh, much more sensitive. So the probe design is such as this, but if you develop a probe that is as long as your uh, mRNA strand, you're never going to get it into the tissue. So usually it might be, uh, I'm not sure if you remember the, um, these are oligomers. So if you use 35 nucleic acids, it's called a 35 mer, taking from this here. So you use a 35 mer cDNA probe. And it can be labeled with uh, a variety of different things. Um, the the markers 
can be a wide range of things such as S35, this is pretty common. Uh, tritium is not typically used. Remember the exposure time we saw in a previous lecture for tritium was like six months and eight months. So if you're willing to wait, it's very good. The S35 is obviously radioactive, uh, giving off the beta particle in particular, uh, and we'll talk about, when we get back to the slides, we'll talk about how that's uh, detected. Uh, it also can be uh, enzyme linked. Now in order to get enzyme linked, <clears throat> you've got to have your 35 mer that is specific for your, uh, your RNA, your messenger RNA, and then you have to add on to it some additional residues of nucleic acids that uh, um, somehow allow you to get an enzyme stuck to it. Typically the enzyme is not on it because DNA might be that big and the enzyme might be this big. I know that's not correct, but anyway, you see the problem. If the enzyme is much larger than the, the DNA, then you're never going to get the DNA into the tissue or into the cell if the enzyme is already linked to it. But these might be biotinylated uh, residues here, and then later you can get the enzymes stuck to the biotin. And I still have my enzyme molecules a little too big there, but anyway. <clears throat> then an enzyme reaction allows you to visualize uh, where the enzyme is, and where the enzyme is is where your cDNA hybridized uh, to the RNA in the tissue. So there's a, a lot of steps in the procedure, so uh, specificity and uh, selectivity and threshold for measurement, which is obviously the part of the sensitivity of the, the method, uh, are all quite challenging. Uh, the uh, term used for the uh, parameters for hybridization Uh, basically is stringency. So this is the term used to ask about, ask about the approach, the, the temperature and certain chemicals uh, in the uh, solutions when you uh, have added your uh, probe so that it, if it's really stringent then you should only, you should be in conditions that favor the highest specificity of the binding or the hybridization of your probe to your message. If your stringency levels are low, then you're more likely to detect more signal, but it might be less specific. So there's all of these types of things that you have to play with uh, to make sure that uh, you have the specificity and sensitivity balanced, and it really comes down to, other than probe design, uh, the stringency of your method. So now we have a pretty good understanding of our probe design. Let's go back to our lecture slides <coughs> uh, and follow through. So we'll discuss that in a bit more detail. Obviously in this one we have a, a probe that is obviously much smaller than our messenger RNA strand. It is uh, labeled with an isotope. So uh, we go through the hybridization uh, 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 step of the procedure. <coughs> Then obviously you've got to rinse off. Anytime you're doing a binding assay, you have to uh, do some type of a wash that will separate the bound from the free. In this case, we wash the tissue or the cells, and uh, you know it's in very similar reagents uh, that have you know the sperm whale DNA in it and all these different types of things that seem kind of funny at times um, to. Uh, to keep the conditions favorable to sustain your specific binding and minimize your non-specific binding. This is always, as we know, the challenge uh, to keep your signal to noise ratio very high. You've got to keep your non-specific binding really low. So the wash occurs in a very similar solution as all the others. Uh, and you want to get the unbound probe out of there and have only your bound probe, hopefully specifically brown, bound probe, uh, remaining in the tissue. Then we have to ask ourselves how we will, how are we going to visualize where our probe is bound within the tissue. This is standard for visualization localization approaches. <clears throat> and we're using radioactive um, label in this example so 
We want to air dry our samples. If it's enzyme labeled, we can't air dry because uh, then we mess up everything of trying to get our enzymes in there, or if the enzymes are already there, we're going to destroy the enzyme activity. So the air drying is necessary in this type of procedure where it's radio labeled because uh, <clears throat> you can uh, put a piece of x-ray film right on top of it, and then obviously, as we'll see in the next slide, the, the beta particles come out and uh, will contribute to the generation of an image uh, that's not so useful for high resolution localization, uh, but still there's a, a low resolution localization, but definitely detection and visualization is, is possible. Uh, <clears throat> the exposure to an x-ray film is more likely to allow you to perform quantitative analyses than simply quote coding it with an emulsion. So uh, in the, the present days of digital photography, not of us, not many of us, handle film anymore, but uh, hopefully we remember that uh, film has a dull side and a shiny side. The shiny side is the plastic side. The other side, the dull side, is where it's covered with an emulsion. And we usually use light to expose it. Well, anything that can generate enough uh, energy uh, so that it can interact and with these that produce black and white, interacts with a silver halide uh, um, uh, salt in the emulsion and can uh, cause to turn into this little teeny uh, particle of metallic silver and then later when it's developed that little uh, nucleus of uh, the metallic silver gets enlarged in the developing process up to the uh, size where we can resolve it and see it. So uh, you can coat the slides with an emulsion. It's a gel emulsion, uh, emulsion that's got the silver halide in it. You just buy it, warm it up, dip the slides in it just right so you get a nice thin layer. Um, uh, got to do it in the dark because if it's exposed to light, then you lose everything. Same thing with this. So you got to get accustomed to doing things in the complete dark, all with your hands and uh, remembering where you're putting stuff and doing everything. <coughs> um, once the emulsion uh, has had time to harden or solidify, then you uh, put it in a similar type of light tight device and start your exposure. For the S35, it can just be three or four days, depending upon what level of uh, message uh, you think, in this case messenger RNA that you have in the tissue or molecule of interest. Uh, if it's, you suspect a low level, you expose for a longer period of time. Uh, <coughs> and uh, you, know, you can expose it for three days, take that off, put another one on, develop it. If it isn't right, let the next one go for four days, and so on and so forth like that. The, the half-life of the S35 is uh, several months, I think, so you definitely have a few weeks where you can still get strong signal from it. And in the end, you get uh, visualization and localization. So we'll look at some examples of how this is used uh, as we proceed. So this slide is just uh, showing us, in this case, these were cells that were treated with tritiated thymidine. So it's actually becoming incorporated into DNA as the cells are dividing. It's a little different approach uh, to getting uh, the radio-labeled marker into the cell. <coughs> um, but uh, I'm going to go back to the document camera in just a moment to talk about uh, how you could get in C2 hybridization looking like this, where your silver grains are uh, superimposing uh, the, over the nucleus of the cell. So this is lightly counterstained with just a general stain to show, to let us see the subcellular organelles, in this case the nucleus, and uh, the silver grains are on there. We've already seen some images of this when we talked about the steroid receptors, uh, where you used a radio labeled steroid receptor, giving it to the animal or expose the cells to it, wash off, unbound, and then fix the tissue and do the same approach to see the radio labeled uh, ligand, the hormone, uh, bound to its receptor in the nucleus. So whatever gets the, the radio label into the tissue, it's still the same thing. The tissue is on the microscope slide, and the beta particles go through the silver uh, halide, uh, <clears throat> in this case, silver bromide uh, uh, photographic emulsion and uh, creates an enucleation of the silver particle when you develop it in the developing solutions, uh, 
then it just makes it bigger. It causes more silver to deposit onto that original silver me metallic particle until uh, you can visualize it. So you can obviously overdevelop and underdevelop. It all has to be standardized uh, and things like that. <clears throat> so here's uh, an example uh, of in situ hybridization in the hippocampus. Uh, for those of you that can, are familiar with the hippocampus, you recognize this as the, the pyramidal cells of the CA region, the uh, cornua ammons or ammons horn. And then this is the dentate uh, gyrus, the primary cells there, the granule cells. And in this case, it's in situ hybridization for the muscarinic uh, receptor, messenger RNAs. Uh, <clears throat> and um, let's see what we have got here. In panel E, they used a, a random mirror. That's a control. I know they got other ones. Uh, the S35 tail randomer in E, A, B, C, D, E, didn't produce any specific signal, just the, uh, the background. <clears throat> you, can all, you can also use a, a sense strand as your control. Uh, to get the background. So the sense strand should be the exact same as the messenger RNA, so it shouldn't uh, bind to your messenger RNA, but any place that uh, a probe of the, your same size, your 35 mer, might stick non-specifically, uh, it would uh, be there. I think this is for different subunits of the, uh, the uh, mu, excuse me, the, the muscarinic uh, receptor. So let's not be too concerned about exactly which it is, but you can see that a couple are present in high levels of intensity and uh, others are not. So you can definitely visualize it, you can definitely localize it, and if you've got appropriate instrumentation, you can actually uh, quantitate it. <clears throat> Here are some examples uh, of uh, some of these. So the S35 labeled, you can change your illumination to a dark field and then wherever it's located, uh, the silver granules are, it turns white, and then wherever they're in low density, uh, it's dark. <clears throat> so I explained this, I think in one other case, the dark field illumination sends the light through at an angle, so if there's nothing in the tissue, it just goes through and it doesn't go up into your microscope. If it hits a silver grain, then it bounces off and goes up into your microscope, uh, and so the black particles look white, and what would be white under normal uh, uh, bright field illumination, as we see over here, is going to be white. So if this were dark field illumination, every one of these little silver grains would look white and everything else would look uh, dark. This is an example of the hypothalamic paraventricular nucleus. Uh, I think they probed for vasopressin. They used alkaline phosphatase that deposited right within the tissue uh, a chromogen marker. It's a, a permanent labeling. Uh, so definitely anatomical localization, but not really uh, amenable to any type of quanti semi-quantitation. Here we see in the uh, striatum uh, of the forebrain, uh, I think this is uh, enkephalin, uh, S35 labeled enkephalin. So again, it's dark field. So wherever you see these uh, dense little uh, collections, we assume that that's a neuron containing the messenger RNA for enkephalin. Uh, this is uh, what you can get with the emulsion coded. You can actually see the cellular localization. And I think this is from a previous one uh, where, well, actually I'm not sure exactly what is labeled on here, but it's combined with the next method that we're going to talk about briefly, the immunocytochemistry, where uh, <clears throat> you uh, use antibodies to label for proteins within the tissue. So. This might be looking at the messenger RNA for vasopressin and then using immunochemistry uh, to look at the vasopressin where you could say the message and the protein are in the same cell, or maybe it's CRH for the in situ hybridization and uh, vasopressin to show their co-localization uh, within the same neurons in the hypothalamic paraventricular nucleus. Whatever the approach would be, it is possible to mix the in situ hybridization in some cases uh, with the immunocytochemistry to say this message is expressed in this cell that also contains this uh, protein. Or if you're really good, you can combine it with uh, in situ hybridization with an enzyme linked uh, 
to say this enzyme deposit, color deposition is superimposed by these silver grains. So I've got these two markers found within this same cell. At a lower magnification, so this obviously uh, in the upper panel allows you the resolution on a cellular level. And I've even seen one research article where they counted the number of silver grains over cells and went through some calculation to come up with a number of messenger RNA copies per cell. That's far too much uh, work to uh, uh, be useful. <clears throat> but anyway, it was very interesting uh, how that was utilized. Otherwise, uh, here we're looking at the um, TRH uh, receptor, A1 type, A2 subtype, and the B1. And you can just uh, use this method with the uh, X-ray film to do these uh, global types of mapping studies. Obviously, uh, we can see the hippocampus here, even though it's really teeny tiny, and the cortex on top of it. Uh, and this is uh, the midbrain where some of the substantia nigra would be, some of those dopamine neurons that we've talked about, <clears throat> the A10 uh, dopamine neurons here in the ventral tegmental area. Uh, and it might be still some of the serotonin neurons about in this area here uh, of the midbrain. So uh, there's very little staining uh, of these receptors in the midbrain, but the cortex, excuse me, very low levels of message, it's not a stain, uh, in the midbrain areas, but high levels of expression uh, or presence of this message in the cortex uh, and uh, in the hippocampus. Uh, of the mouse brain here. So you can see that it can be used for generalized mapping studies of the expression of receptor subunits of any type of gene product that you're interested in as long as you can develop the probe. So how do you get those types of images? Well, I've been using this for, let's see, 1989, <laughs> for quite a few years now, a couple decades almost. Uh, so the uh, computer systems, uh, this is an original PC, the 8088, if you uh, even know what an 8088 IBM computer is, now that we're up into the, the Pentiums, <coughs> uh, maybe it was uh, uh, 100 megahertz uh, in speed, if it was lucky, now you can almost get a, a 3 gigahertz, so <coughs> uh, this is kind of old, but basically you've got uh, some type of a camera system, and these cameras are now uh, as big as the lens on this one here. Not, this one was a gigantic one, almost as big as your head. <laughs> so uh, the technology's uh, updated a bit. But you need a camera system and some, type, some form of light box to illuminate. So you've got a trans-illumination for the X-ray films, um, or uh, it can fit right on the microscope as, as shown in this one here and then you can uh, use the dark field or whatever type of microscopy you're going to use, capture the image in the computer, uh, and then you can use uh, digital image uh, software to prepare your figures for presentation. Used to be you have to expose film, take it to the dark room, develop your film to the negative, take your negative to the dark room and make your prints and then you know, label all your prints. Now you just bring it into Adobe Photoshop or whatever you use put your arrows and everything on there, work with the contrast and put it all together, save it as a PDF or a JPEG and uh, submit it uh, <coughs> for publication and so forth. So it's all uh, uh, very uh, contemporary and digital uh, nowadays. And obviously you can perform the, digit, the data analysis. Uh, you can just use the data software to select the area that you want it to quantitate get an optical density, so it is semi-quantitative uh, in that sense. Or if you want, you can sit there and count silver grains over cells and try to use a quantitation from that uh, methodological approach. So the next method uh, we'll talk about briefly uh, is the immunocytochemistry, but I want to go back to the document camera uh, to uh, critically evaluate <coughs> uh, what we had just described for in C2 hybridization that also would apply for uh, the northern blot if you uh, homogenized the tissue. So we said we would use our messenger RNA in the cytoplasm as our target for developing our cDNA probe. So what this means is that we end up with, and let's think about quantitation, uh, the uh, 
in C2 gives you semi-quantitation uh, and localization. The northern blot, uh, unless you've got that very expensive one like I described, or use a microscope to say, you know, dissect out just this area. We saw that image of the paraventricular nucleus with the cells stained like this. Uh, we could go in with a laser and say, you know, pluck out this chunk of tissue and take it and analyze it. <clears throat> so methods are catching up where you can uh, use northern blot, uh, homogenous approaches to be very selective. The sensitivity is much better uh, nowadays, and so it is possible. Before, you'd have to homogenize basically the hypothalamus and measure your message in there with the northern uh, technique. Now, if you've got the, this instrumentation, you can section the brain and just get out the paraventricular nucleus. But with the in situ, like we just saw, you can have your silver grains uh, over the paraventricular nucleus and your software, you can just outline it and say, give me the optical density of this. You get your treated animal and your, your control group where you'd measure the, it again. And here you might have zero, exp, opt, zero expression and here you might have a, a, a tenfold increase or something like that. Uh, optical density, I think, is uh, different where <clears throat> the more black it is, it has uh, a low number. And uh, Anyway, you'd have to check on that with your software of what value you're getting. <clears throat> uh, but this has many more silver grains than this, so it would have a, uh, uh, an optical density of a greater intensity. But what does this mean? What is this telling us? It's telling us how much message is in the cytoplasm uh, of the cells in this area. It's not telling us anything about uh, the rate of gene expression. It is an index of the rate of gene expression. So this is a, an index, right? It's a static index. At the time of collecting the sample in the tissue or the cells at that time, this is the relative amount of messenger RNA that was present. It's arbitrary units, units of optical uh, density, whatever that means as far as the number of copies of messenger RNA per cell. We don't know, but anyway, uh, is a tenfold increase of biological significance. I would suspect, yes, it would be. <clears throat> but that's just message in the cytoplasm. Uh, what does it really mean for uh, reflecting or being a reliable index of gene expression? Uh, remember the life cycle of a molecule. Static index of messenger RNA levels. Uh, is it a riboprobe? Excuse me. Um, a ribo riboprotein. Remember, this was a, a stabilized but untranslated form. <clears throat> Maybe it's just sitting there in the uh, cytoplasm. Uh, is it being translated? Uh, is it being degraded and there's just enough of it left? Remember the, um, the pool, the inactive pool that we contribute to from synthesis, the expression contributes to an inactive pool that's activated, performs biological activity, translation in this case, and then it's degraded and removed from the pool. So a static level of messenger RNA means what, especially related to gene expression? So it is possible to have a more direct index, an actual direct index of gene expression, if you look at heteronuclear uh, RNA. And heteronuclear RNA are probes that are specific for uh, the uh, RNA processing steps. So you, you might have an overlap of exon 1, intron 1. So any form, <clears throat> and you know the strategies for coming up with a probe against heteronuclear RNA, again think of it, you've got your primary transcript and then all forms of it being uh, spliced along the way, 
to your exons and maybe one more that's not quite spliced. Whatever this is, this whole collection from the primary transcript all the way through to the mature RNA, uh, mRNA in the nucleus. You know, so this would give you a label in the nucleus, not in the cytoplasm. This is all heteronuclear RNA. So if you have a probe that detects all of this, this is the most direct index of gene expression. It's much more challenging to perform, more sophisticated approach to develop your probe, so it's seen less commonly uh, in uh, the research. So uh, even the DNA microarray that we talk about uh, focuses just on messenger RNA, so it's a static index of the levels of messenger RNA in the tissue, and we have to ask ourselves, how reliable is that of an index uh, for the rate of gene expression. So we have to be careful about how people interpret uh, this type of information. Oh, gene expression increased tenfold. No, the level of message in the tissue at this time point was tenfold greater than in the control animals at that same point in time. It doesn't mean that we had a tenfold increase in gene expression. We can assume that that's happening, but we don't have the evidence uh, to document that. So I'm just going to take a, a few more minutes here to go back to the computer and talk about the immunocytochemistry. Um, it's a similar approach where you would take either the cells or the tissue and section it uh, the same way. In this case, you do use uh, cross-linking agents. You fix your protein, or your molecule of interest in the tissue before you begin the processing. You have to permeabilize the tissue a little bit because you've got to get antibodies into the tissue now. Before we had to worry about getting a, a, either a cDNA or a cRNA probe into the tissue or the cells. Now we've got to get antibodies through the membranes uh, in the tissue. Uh, but <clears throat> um, first thing we get in is you, know, you wash the tissue and then you're going to expose it to your first reagent uh, that is going to target and bind to your, your molecule of interest the antigen in this case. So that's the primary antibody for the immunocytochemistry. And then um, since the primary antibody is typically the most precious and expensive, we usually don't try to label that with anything because you never get 100% yield. So if it's a very precious antibody, get a 50% yield, that's not a very efficient utilization of your reagents. So it's easier to generate an antibody against the species in which you have uh, generated your first antibody. For example, maybe your primary antibody was in rabbit. So then you take rabbit immunoglobulin G, this is the IgG uh, subtype of antibody that you want to use. <coughs> um, then you inject a lot of uh, rabbit IgG into a goat, produce goat anti-rabbit. And then you can label that secondary, easy to produce, you can produce volumes of it. So if your yield isn't very high, it's not a problem. They're not very expensive or precious antibodies uh, in production. In this case, uh, the biotin label the uh, second antibody, the goat anti-rabbit in our example. And then you can expose it to this avidin biotin peroxidase complex. So avidin uh, is uh, found in tissues. Biotin is a micronutrient. So we have within our body, every tissue has a little bit of avidin within it to bind biotin. Uh, prime uh, example is uh, egg white. Egg white has a very high amount of avidin in it to bind to biotin. So these are natural biological phenomena that are basically being exploited methodologically as we typically do. So you can mix together some avidin and some biotinylated peroxidase and enzyme, <coughs> uh, get it all mixed together, and then you can use uh, a, what's called a substrate chromogen solution. If you've got an enzyme, you have a substrate for it. In this case, it's hydrogen peroxide for peroxidase. And chromogen, a diaminobenzidine, or DAB. You'll hear people refer to this as DAB. It's uh, diaminobenzidine. Uh, <coughs> it's in monomeric form. When you have the enzyme reaction, energy is produced that will polymerize this diaminobenzidine and produce a color precipitate, which in this image up here is the brown color in these GnRH neurons. Uh, 
This uh, is also stained with another chromogen and specific antibody for vasoactive intestinal peptide that in the location of the GNRH neurons is only within axons. So we can see these little beaded axons and their terminals making contact with uh, the GNRH neurons. So this is one way that we know that VIP neurons, and it's been performed for many different types of transmitters and neuropeptides, VIP neurons innervate GNRH neurons. Uh, we'd have to go to the electron microscope level to verify that there's a synapse here, but this gives us pretty substantial evidence that there's axodendritic and axosomatic contacts, these putative uh, uh, synaptic uh, interactions, and you can see it here at high magnification. So immunocytochemistry definitely lets you uh, visualize and localize with pretty high resolution. If you can take it to electron microscope level, then it can be at a higher resolution. Here's another method. Uh, this was called the avidin biotin uh, uh, method. <clears throat> and uh, this one is co just called indirect uh, enzyme linked. Uh, these are not essential terms uh, for you at this time. They're mostly just these are two different approaches to immunocytochemistry to link an enzyme marker to your primary antibody stuck to your antigen in the tissue. In this case, it's alkaline phosphatase. You have different um, parameters for the enzyme uh, histochemistry, as it's called, where you mix it with the, the substrate chromogen solution. So the alkaline phosphatase has other chromogens that are available that end up with this dark purple or black color. So uh, uh, <clears throat> some people believe that it's a, a higher sensitivity uh, with the alkaline phosphatase because you can run the enzyme reaction for a longer period of time uh, versus the peroxidase reaction up here with the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, but here with the avidin biotin complex, you can end up with as many as 45 peroxidase enzyme molecules uh, in this ABC avidin biotin complex with peroxidase uh, on each uh, primary antibody in the tissue, so you have an amplified sensitivity of your signal uh, in this case. So all these types of things apply. We don't want to be critical, become critically analytic of these methods. It's more of the specificity of the primary antibody, uh, and we'll talk about antibodies binding to antigens, and we talk about radioaminoassay, a very sensitive um, uh, uh, quantitative method uh, for tissue homogenate uh, that obviously doesn't allow visualization and localization, but is very sensitive for quantitation. This is very good for visualization and localization, but very limited for any type of quantitative uh, approach uh, for neuroendocrinology. So that concludes our discussion of uh, the basically localization and semi-quantitative uh, methods for neuroendocrinology. Uh, we'll proceed to more molecular approaches uh, from this point on. I was hoping to take a bit of time uh, today to talk about the, uh, the methods for cellular transfection. I'll just come in on Wednesday and do that uh, at the beginning of that lecture uh, and uh, do it from the overhead and maybe prepare just a couple of uh, uh, rough illustrations uh, in uh, uh, PowerPoint. 